2 Corinthians chapter 9 today. Heart's now beating a little bit faster than it was a moment ago. Thank you, Brother Dave. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> and if you will, let's begin in verse number 1. If you're able to do so, if you would stand for a moment, let's read these verses together beginning in verse 1. And we'll read down through verse number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. <clears throat> and let's begin in verse 1. For as touching the ministry to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, <clears throat> that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. Lest happily if they, be of, they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, uh, that we say not, ye should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Verse 10. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruit of your righteousness, being enriched, verse 11, in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. And we've been looking at this aspect of God getting our first fruits, whatever that may be, specifically, and today we we'll want to look at the aspect of putting God first in the area of prompted giving. When God stirs in our heart to do something, to invest something, to help someone else, how should we respond to that in a way that puts God first? Let's pray. Let's ask God to help us today. Lord, thank you for the joy it is to be in this setting today. Lord, I pray we would never get over uh, the freedom that we have, the, the privilege that we have to open your word, and Lord, to receive from it your truth, your revelation, that Lord reminds us of who we are not, where we fail and where we fall short, and reminds us also how abundantly sufficient you are how much Jesus Christ has fulfilled and has enabled. And I pray today that you would stir in our hearts, Lord, not our minds, but our hearts today. That, Lord, we might be moved deeply by this aspect of being a prompted giver. That, Lord, that we would not hoard, that we would not hold on to, but that, God, we would freely give to those in need. That, Father, we would do so with a cheerful disposition and that, Lord, you might be honored and glorified as a result. Bless this study today, be honored in it. May you speak to each heart as you see fit, and we'll thank you and praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you this morning, if I were to ask you what title would you like to go by? I don't know if you have in your mind you would like to be called Dr. So-and-so. Um, many of us, that's, that's not in the cards for us. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I don't know what title you would like or surname you would like as far as reference point. But I will tell you this, if I were to say to you today, you know what, I really appreciate you. Um, and, and I just have this term of endearment I'd like to bequeath upon you. And that title would be the word Scrooge. How many of you would just be deeply moved by that? Maybe not in a positive way, all right? Thank you very much for that, Pastor. You big old Scrooge you. That's not meant as, man, I love you. You know, that's a, something different. I was reading an article the other day that was interesting to me, was talking about, uh, have you ever heard of the, the, the classic, as they call it, maybe you've seen it in dramatic form, The Christmas Carol? Have any of you heard of that book? Maybe you were forced to read it against your will in English lit class. Again, going back to the doctor thing for some of us. Uh, but anyway, that book, I was reading the other day that uh, what birthed that book in Charles Dickens' mind, what, what created that narrative, there's more to that story than just, uh, you know, the, the basic tenets that maybe we think of, the narrative or the plot. But in 19th century England, the, the word, just this is an illustration, the holiday Christmas had fallen on hard times. In fact, I was sharing with my wife just last night about, I had never heard of this before, or read this before. 
but it was almost extinct there in Great Britain during uh, those years that Charles Dickinson lived. And from 1790, I almost can't believe this, through 1834, the number one paper in, in, in Britain, specifically in London, did not mention the word Christmas. For 45 years, uh, it was not even well known. And, and to me, I always think of in London or in England, you know, Christmas has just a classic feel to it, but it had fallen on hard times. And one in 10 people there in that, that economy and in that structure were poverty stricken. And Charles Dickens had other things that motivated the book. But one of the spirit of, of the book was he was trying to make all the Scrooges feel bad about being a Scrooge. And, and most of us, I think if we're honest this morning, we don't want to be the Scrooge that begins the story, but we, we wouldn't mind being seen and viewed as the Scrooge that ends the book, one of generosity, one that's open to meeting and ministering to the needs and being a help and blessing to others. And today we want to talk about, as found here in our text today, this idea of being a prompted giver and specifically putting God first when God stirs in our heart and moves us to be a blessing and encouragement to someone else. Now, last week we talked about what was more obedience. We talked about, we dealt with the very, the very uh, controversial aspect of tithes and what that is to a grace giver and, and talked about how grace doesn't lower the bar. If anything, it raises the bar of our motivation and our giving to the Lord. Today has more to do with faith. How do I trust God and how do I follow God as He prompts me and how do I honor the Lord with my first fruits in the area of prompting? Now here in our text this morning, we're in chapter 9. Lord willing, next week we'll probably talk a little bit about chapter 8. But you have, Paul is writing the church at Corinth and he's telling them, hey, let me remind you what the Macedonian givers did in poverty. And now let me encourage you what you committed to giving now to follow through on it. And he's instructing and encouraging them to follow the prompting that God had produced in their life. And so I hope today God will give you a few truths that will help you be more in tune with the Lord in this area of gracious giving. Now before we get to the specifics, can I give you what I use in my life, and I've noticed many that are ahead of me spiritually, which is most everybody, what they do that's helped them in this area of stewardship, is first you have what's called plan giving. I think you ought to have a weekly or a monthly plan of how you're going to be generous with your time, your abilities, and your resources through the local church and other ways God leads you. But then secondly, that you're prepared when God prompts you to be a blessing and encouragement, either through the church or some other way that you have ministry, that you're ready for that moment. And that's the spirit of our study today is to help us all be ready when God prompts us to do something above and beyond what we plan to do for the Lord in this area. Now, there are two motivations we want to look at that are found here in this chapter that will help us do prompted giving in a way that God is honored and glorified. First of all, number one, you and I ought to be motivated by the fact that by giving, when God prompts us, it shares a blessing for others. Um, Valentine's Day was yesterday. Man, don't you feel bad for the restaurant industry? I don't know if you had plans yesterday. I know several, I have several friends or folks that are in that industry, and I think the snowstorm yesterday just killed that for a lot of people, just the timing of that, at least in our area. but Valentine's Day was yesterday. Have you ever, any of you ever gotten those little, uh, the little hearts, you know, that have the little things stamped on them? You know, I have a theory about those. They put the little letters on them, you know, be mine or whatever, something cheesy, so they don't realize you're eating a piece of chalk. You know, have you ever, what do those things even taste like? Here, let me be a blessing to you. Here's a chunk of chalk with I love you on it, you know, or whatever the case may be. How do we give things that are a blessing, that actually enrich the life of someone else that God has led into our path of influence. Well, here in this text this morning, God instructs these believers to remember others as they consider God's leading and God's prompting in the area of ministry. Notice, if you will, verse 1. Paul says this, For his touching, notice the ministry to the saints... It is superfluous, or it's excessive. It's a waste for me to write to you. They already knew of the need back in Jerusalem. They knew that they should give. They knew that they needed to be a blessing. Now, if you will go to the end of verse number two, he says, uh, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Number one, you and I should give to be a blessing because it gives to others a public challenge. It gives to them a challenge to give and to be sacrificial in their own life and their own ministry. I love to be around giving people. I hope others, when they're around me, they see generosity, they see graciousness, they see a willingness to be a blessing to others. And so there is this public challenge. When we give to others, it encourages them and it challenges them 
to do likewise. And I would give you just two areas. Number one, first of all, we challenge others with our fervor or our passion. Notice he says, your zeal hath provoked very many. Their example would encourage others to give to the Lord as well. Remember in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, it says, where our heart is, or where our treasure is, our heart will be also. That there's a direct connection between our resources and our abilities and our time in our heart. And when we give to the Lord, it demonstrates our passion. It reveals the heart that we have for not just the Lord, but for others. And you and I know that we can give without passion. Have you ever given something to someone and you just didn't really mean it, but you needed to? You know, that token Christmas gift that you re-gifted to them, you got from someone else that re-gifted it to you the year before? And you're giving, but without passion. That's possible. But it's impossible to have passion without giving. And many times I think we, before our young people, I think you understand in the tone, we have, we have a wide mix of folks in our church, but we have a lot of young people in other places in the room this morning, in the building. They're gauging our love for the Lord based upon what we're giving and what we're not giving. What greater way to demonstrate our love than to do so by challenging them with a passionate gift for the Lord. Then if you will, notice the beginning of verse number two. He says, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them at Macedonia. All right, These believers that he talks about back in chapter eight, I've told them that you guys want to be a help and blessing. Notice, he says uh, that Achaia was ready a year ago. Uh, and so he's encouraging them to not just commit, but then to follow through. Basically, here's what it is. It's been a year since they said, yeah, we'll help, we'll help, and yet they've yet to do what they committed to. Uh, so number two, not only do we encourage and challenge others with our fervor, but number two, with our finishing, by finishing what we have committed to give, what we've committed to be a blessing and encouragement to someone else. The Macedonians, back in chapter 8, they were kind of slow starters. They, it took them a while. They're in suffering, they're in difficulty, but they finished their commitment. The Corinthians were eager to help, eager to commit, but then this follow-through process, Paul is working with them and encouraging them to finish what they had offered to the Lord. In fact, if you go back to chapter 8 and verse 7, he says, Therefore as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. What grace? The grace of giving. Finish it. Do what you've committed. Verse 10 of chapter 8, and here and I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, but not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Do what you've committed. Finish what you've set forward in the past. See, passionate giving, prompted uh, passion is only completed when we actually give to God what He's laid on our heart. I, I know a lot of times I've said, hey, can I be a blessing? I want to be a help to you. And I even offer something, but then do I follow through on that? Do you? Uh, may we be willing to demonstrate to others a challenging finish, doing what we've committed to doing. I was reading an article a few months ago that, I, I'll be honest with you, that I'm still processing even this morning its application in my own life. But the author said this. He said, quote, Christians teach their kids stories like David and Goliath, Daniel in the lion's den, and then spend their time trying to make sure no one gets hurt, nothing gets lost, and everyone is, quote, safe in the end. And the author said this, convicted me. The disconnect is profound if you think about it. Read the Bible, live the opposite way. Don't trust God, play it safe, live an insignificant life, risk nothing. This Bible is replete with people who sacrificially finish what God gave to them to do. We, we, we teach from it, we quote it, we memorize it. But dearly beloved, we're not finishing the faith that God has given to us. We're not sacrificially invested in a way that challenges others to buy into our faith. You know what I know you value what you invest in, and you know that of me as well. And to me, this prompted giving is such an opportunity to demonstrate to others, not for our benefit, but for God's glory and for their plugging into God's cause for us to risk, to give, to sacrifice, to finish what God has laid in our heart. And with God's grace and God's help, may we be those people for the Lord in the days ahead. Now, if you will, go back to our text and look at verse 3. Let's spend just a few minutes here in verses 3 to 5. So there's a public challenge that when we give, when we follow through, when God prompts us, hey, I want you to give, I want you to invest, I want you to spend some time or develop this gift or ability, it's a challenge to others. But notice now verse 3, yet have I sent the brethren 
All right, these brethren are referred to back in chapter 8 and verse 6. It's Titus and a couple of the brethren with him. Notice, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf that I said you may be ready. Basically, verses 3 to 5 is Paul saying, hey, I've told others that you're going to invest in the work of God, and, and I just want to make sure that we all follow through on the commitments that we've made. Uh, and so number two, not only does our giving bless others with a challenge and encourages them to plug in and to give, but number two, it confirms our own commitment to the cause of Christ, this sacrificial, prompted giving that God lays upon our heart. Uh, in Creston, where we live, uh, we had a little snow there as well the last few days, and uh, one of our neighbors, one street over from us, uh, on Pine Street, which runs behind uh, Norway High School, built one of the largest snowmen I've ever seen. Uh, some of you saw my wife posted a picture online, but I, I'm not exaggerating, and we preachers are renowned for that. I'm not exaggerating. This, this is a real story, right? This one right here. Uh, but the, the, the snowman is probably, I would say, between 13 to 16, maybe 17 feet tall, the, the snowman. And they, I mean, they put a lot of time into this thing. They actually, you could tell they encased it in ice, like it'd run water over it to kind of harden it so it would hold longer. Uh, for those of you who are snowman experts. And so they did all this work, but it's so big that they took a safety cone, like, you know, those orange cones? And that's the nose. That's how big it is. And then they have a big old, like, 50-gallon trash can as the black hat on top. And the thing is just massive for the world to see their great, you know, public demonstration of how much they enjoy the winter. Me, I'm huddled around the fire saying I can't wait till spring. You know, that's my own view of winter sometimes. But they wanted the world to see their craftsmanship, their, their, their skill in developing that snowman. Do you know often in our, our giving, we don't realize the public confirmation that is? Um, and, and I'm not picking on anybody. I hope you understand. There are a lot of people that had a good reason to not be here this morning. But I think it was good for my neighbors to see me leave for church today. Now, I left early enough. They may not have seen me. But for your neighbors to see you come to church today, you, you're giving yourself to something today. Do, do you realize the benefit that is to not just your own testimony, but to the significance of the gospel? When we support missionaries, we have missionaries coming in a few months. I can't wait. I hope we can take on some new missionaries this year. And when, we take, when the community sees us invest in people we'll never meet, until heaven, and they see us value it enough to give to it and let God prompt our hearts. It, it raises the bar of the significance of what we believe in. And our prompted giving gives public confirmation that there's value, there's significance to the work of God, there's value to who God is in our lives. In fact, if you go back to chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, look at the last verse. He says, Wherefore, show ye to them, and before the churches, the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. And he's saying, listen, come on guys, follow through. Do what God's prompted you to do. It will prove, it will show to others what is true and what is right. So our prompted giving, I encourage you to make sure when God speaks to you that you respond because it gives this public confirmation. Now, a couple things I'd give you under that. Number one, first of all, it confirms that we are pliable, that we are submitted to God's leading in our lives. If you go back to verse 3, he talks about these brethren, as I mentioned, Titus, a pastor, and some other uh, lay leadership in the church come to encourage them. If you go down to verse number five, he says, therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before you and make up beforehand your bounty, wherever you have noticed before that the same might be ready as the matter of, as the matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. And so he sends these leaders to encourage them and challenge them in the area of giving. Um, and I, this is just... This is all I'll say about it. But next Sunday, we have a special offering we do every year. And I just, I just want to share this with you. We have, for us to do what God wants us to do in the new year, it's going to take giving. It's going to take your giving and my giving. And I'm not just talking in a financial sense. The more we grow and the more we develop, the more needs we have. Today, we were covering some bases as some folks were gone and trying to make sure everything was taken care of. And as we grow and develop, we need more uh, of folks who will respond to the prompting of God. Who, who sets the chart? Who sets the direction in our church? The leadership does, right? That's okay with you, isn't it? Godly leadership. And if we're off base, then yeah, there needs to be something addressed. But if God has you here, then it's to support and help and encourage the leaders of the ministries in our church. And one of the best ways you can is say, you know what? you got a growth group at 915. I'll be there at 915, ready, prepared, ready to receive. And you're supporting their ministry. I'm not picking on you today. Today's the exception. All right, we'll cut you a little break today. 
Um, I'll, I'll give in the offering to help the staff stay here during the week and prepare the services and the ministries we have. I'll buy into the new things that God's leading our church to do. Because if God has you here and he has me here, it probably means we need to work together. And so this giving confirms that, hey, I, I'm, I'm in, I, I'm involved, I'm supportive. And, and we see that demonstrated in the giving of the church. And, and I, I just encourage you, if you have pushback, some of you lead in other areas. I read a statement the other day that's encouraged me as a pastor. Leaders, people are not necessarily against you. They're just for themselves. That, that's more the reality of it. And, and I understand that. And sometimes I think we leaders, we misconstrue maybe a response from someone, but it's not so much folks are against us, they're just for themselves. You're for yourself, I'm for myself. Giving moves our heart to be supportive and to demonstrate that in a public fashion. If God's called you here, God wants you to support and buy into what God's doing here. So I encourage you with that this morning. Now, did you notice a little word found in verse 5? He says your bounty. He uses that word bounty. The idea is one of blessing. It's not to take, it is to give. It's not just to shell out, but it is to receive that which God can do only when we are generously responding as God prompts us. When a Christian is faithful in his giving, or she is in her giving, it will be a blessing and encouragement to others. It will challenge them. It will encourage them. It will give them confidence. Now lastly, if you will, notice the end of verse 3. He says, Lest our boasting view should be in vain of this behalf that I said, notice this, ye may be ready. Number two, we confirm not just that we're pliable, we yield to God's leadership. Number two, it confirms our preparation. It confirms our preparation. Um, have you ever noticed, right after you get a paycheck, maybe somebody has been a little while since you've received a paycheck, but if you have, have you ever noticed that when you first get a paycheck, you're very free with your money? Have you ever noticed that? You know, if you're especially not disciplined, you are. We tend to be more generous right upon receiving. I think God knows that. Um, I think that's why he structured the first day of the week to be spent in this setting. It's the beginning of something. This first fruit idea is not just God wants dibs on something that's better. He knows that if he starts with us when we first receive, that's when we're most willing to respond to his prompting. And I just encourage you, the first of every day, I think is key for the Lord, don't you? open to his word, his spirit, whenever the first part of your day, maybe for your work schedule, it's the middle of the night, but whenever the first part of your day is that God gets that because that's when you're most open to his leading and his prompting. Same thing in our schedule of the week, the first day of the week, the first part of our resources and our abilities ought to be God's. And as we prepare for giving, we make sure we do so in that area, the first part of what God has blessed us with. One author said this, a steward doesn't wait until the offering plays past to decide how much to give. Something he or she gives a great deal of thought because it's something that means a lot. He understands why he's giving and can visualize the impact of his investment. There's preparation, there is planning that goes into that. And so we confirm with preparation. All right, so the first section is this. We give when God prompts because it shares a blessing with others. Number two, let's spend a few minutes now in verses 6 through 11. There's a second benefit that comes. Look at verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Number two, we give to secure a blessing for ourselves. We give to secure a blessing for ourselves. Um, any of you notice that when you go to any store or any restaurant, it seems like nowadays they have a reward program? You notice that? Uh, do you have a reward card? No, thank you for the 50th time. I don't want it. You know, or, or you try to look through your wallet. You know, my wallet, you guys went through and cleaned your wallet out. You've been sitting on a wad of stuff you'll never need again, you know, 50 or 60 pieces of plastic, you ladies. But those reward cards, they're always trying to get you with that, hey, get our reward card. And I'm thinking, then you're gonna have my phone number and my email, that's how I think, you know, cynically speaking. But they want you to get their reward program. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Uh, we covered this last year. Does God connect rewards to our giving? Yeah. In fact, he gives them to us as a motivation for giving. For some reason, we, want, we think it's super spiritual to give to God and not ever focus on the God who gave the promises connected to that giving. Yes, it's to praise God, it's to be a blessing to others, but it also enriches our life in many ways, and some of them are alluded to here in our text this morning, God's blessings as we're faithful to respond to his prompted giving. And I give you just a couple of them this morning that I hope will enrich your life as you follow God's leading in your heart. Number one, first of all, in verses six to seven, there is enjoyment. There is a personal enjoyment that is given to us 
when we're faithful stewards for the Lord. Why should these Corinthians give generously? Paul gives them two reasons. Notice them. The first one that we just read in verse 6 is we'll enjoy a larger harvest. We, when we're faithful to respond to God's leading, will enjoy a larger uh, harvest. If you were to ask me today, Pastor, what is, the, what is one of the greatest weaknesses that we have mindset-wise as 21st century Christians? I think in my life this is true often, and I see it in you and I see it in others as well. Here's the faulty thinking. No matter what I do or don't do, I'm as good with God as the next person. When God clearly gives certain commands or instructions or invitations that allow us to experience unique blessings and experiences and intimacy with God that's not for just any and everyone. And it's not that those people are more special. I'm just saying there are things God says, if you will do this, I will do this. And one of them is this area of harvest. I know believers that honestly expect to get to heaven and it's just all equal ground. It doesn't matter how you live life, what you did with your faith and the grace of God. We just all start out at the same level. God is clear that there are rewards waiting, right? There's position, not for us, but to bring Him greater praise praise and glory. I just want to serve God in eternity. And what I do now affects that ability and that opportunity. And so we've developed this fatalistic, whatever will be, will be kind of view. When God says, if you will do these things, I will bless you. And here specifically, it's the area of harvesting. None of us would expect to not plant and still produce. And yet many of us live life that way in our walk with the Lord. And God the whole time saying, listen, if you'll just give me the little bit you have and you'll plant it when I prompt you, where I prompt you to plant it, it will yield fruit. Harvest, a larger harvest is the great joy of those people who prompt, when God prompts, they respond by giving. Bountifully, the word used here in verse number 6 is the same word found in verse 5. There is a blessing, an overwhelming blessing of God that comes when we sow as we should. One commentator said this, God will be no man's debtor. He is faithful to bless when we are faithful to obey. And If we'll be faithful to give when he he leads us, he will be faithful to respond with his blessing. Have you ever packed for a trip? Um... Uh, if you're like me, you tend. To, my wife gives me a hard. I always tend to overpack. You know, I'm a little OCD, and I try to think of maybe things that will come up that I'll need this thing. Maybe you ever packed, and you come back from a trip, and three fourths of what you packed you didn't even use. That drive you crazy. It does me. You know, maybe I even paid to fly it across the country and back, or just lugged it around. I think for many of us, when we get to eternity, when we stand before the Lord. Well, think back to the things we lugged around that we should have planted, we should have just let go of, we should have invested in someone, we should have invested in something, and, and we missed out on some harvest, some fruit that could have been ours. Everything we have, everything we are is, is something to be planted, something to be invested so that God can bless it. God can't bless something we don't give to Him. And this area of harvest, if your life is barren today, is that God's fault? There's no souls being saved. There's no lives being impacted. There's nothing being accomplished for the cause of Christ. Is that God's fault or is that maybe your fault or my fault? Or we're not planting and therefore God cannot give that harvest. How sad it is to enter eternity without sow, sowing the seed God has given. One author said this, God prospers you not to raise your standard of living, but to raise your standard of giving. And so may we respond when God gives us seed by planting it when and where he prompts us. All right, now if you will go to verse number seven. There's a second aspect of this personal enjoyment that is ours when we respond to God's prompting. Every man, all right, this is for every person, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Number two, we can enjoy a loved heart, a loved heart. I don't know if you shared any moments of love with your family, or your spouse, or your significant other this past weekend, uh, but this last week, my wife Heidi was trying to be a blessing to us boys. She's the only girl in the house, and she, she now and then she has to interject some love back into what is more of a bruiser, let's beat on each other kind of environment that we have as boys. Not in an abusive way, just it's very man, you know, just grunting kind of interaction, and so she has to interject. And so her attempt this last week, as she often does, is we, the boys and I, and I could visualize this happening as I was opening mine, but she put something in our lunches for a couple days this past week that uh, was kind of to say, I love you, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the girl of the house and I love you, but she gave us these little brownies in the shape of a heart, not the chalk, 
things we were talking about a minute ago, brownies with like uh, frosting and then imprinted into them were like, be mine or I love you or something like that. And it was all, we all three, the boys, we all got home. We didn't know they were in there and we're all talking about them and how good they were and you know, how much we loved them. And she was trying to convey to us her love for us. Now she didn't have to do that, right? I still love her, my boys still love her. But we love the fact that she had expressed the love, just visualizing her walk through Walmart or Bueller's or wherever, seeing those, thinking of us, taking the time to put those in our lunches. Do you know what the Lord, it's not about earning his love. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about he loves to see us express our love. And the way we express our love is when he moves us to do or be something. We can't love on God. I can't hug God. I can't smooch God. I can't connect with God on a tangible way, but I can love on others. I can give myself some time or some resources. And as I give it, as God prompts, he sees that and he gets pleasure. He gets praise from that. I love the last phrase in that verse. He says, for God loveth a cheerful giver. I want God to love what I'm doing for him. When God moves in our heart, may we respond so that He might be enriched. He might draw pleasure from the sacrifice we've given to Him. Another reason for giving generously is God loves generosity. God prizes not the size of the gift, but our sincerity. We're not doing it grudgingly. It's uh, spontaneous. And it's joyful willingness that we give to the Lord. The word cheerful that you see there in verse 7 has the idea of hilarious. I don't know if you've ever had a slapstick, you know, or a slap where you just slap happy. Slapstick, I don't know where that came from. Slap happy late at night, you know, you're on a little sleep and everything's funny. And just, you know, you just, you can't everything. I mean, you just start, someone breathes and you laugh. You know, it's just everything's funny. That, that's the idea of just, it, it, it just, this is euphoric. This is something that I enjoy, something that I embrace. And may that be the spirit and tone of our giving to the Lord. Doesn't discount our obedience but it involves the disposition of our hearts that it is cheerful, it is faithful, and it is a gift that God is pleased with. Does God today love the heart of your giving? Are you responding when He prompts and is He pleased with it? See, giving involves mathematics, and that tends to mean then within that is the potential for it to become a calculation, doesn't it? Well, there's this, this percentage and carry the one and here God is what I give to you. Or here's my week, I have seven days and I'll give you Sunday. And, but at, at midnight, now it's my week again. And we begin to segment our lives and God wants it to be from our heart in a passionate way. Prompted giving gives that to us. All right, now let's spend a few minutes in verses eight and following. Lest you get worried that you're going to run out or I'm going to run out today as we give to God. Notice what it says in verse eight. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. Number two, there is personal engagement. There is personal engagement. I think very few of us have experienced what's described in verse number eight. The engaging of God's power, the enabling of God being a part of our lives on a regular basis. Why is that true? Because often we are short-sighted, we're too busy looking out for ourselves. As a result, we miss the prompting of God. Have you ever caught yourself doing this? Maybe it's even in witnessing. You become aware of a need, and because you're so consumed with yourself, you walk by it and it takes you maybe an hour or maybe a day or two, and I should have done something. I should have been something there for that person. But we miss the prompting because we're focused on our needs. Who's responsible for our needs? God. We're responsible to follow His prompting. I'm not saying we don't work and we don't don't steward, we don't manage what God has entrusted to us, but God is the one responsible for our needs. And so we need to focus on following through where God gives us opportunity to be a blessing. And as we do so, He will enable us to do and be more for Him. Now, I give you just a couple things in that area this morning. I hope we encourage you and dare you to get more involved in giving. Number one, first of all, when we give to the Lord, it engages uh, the divine sufficiency that only God can give. I read a statement the other day that was so encouraging. Uh, we won't get into the specifics of gambling or lottery or those kind of things, but I read a statement the other day that said this, quote, the chances of you dying on your way to get a lottery ticket are greater than winning that lottery ticket. Especially on today, your chances really are high that you probably will die rather than get the lottery ticket winning. You know how much risk is involved in any promises or promotions the world offers? The odds that are against you or for you? 
With God, there's no odds. There's no risk. God has promised that He is able to make all things ours as we're faithful to respond to Him. may break down these verses very quickly as we think on some application today. Verse number 80 talks about the idea of all. Did you notice that word all that's found? All grace abound toward you that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. And there is a comprehensive sufficiency that God gives. In fact, the word sufficiency, this concept, happens a couple times in the book of 2 Corinthians. Would you go back to chapter 3? I think we have time to look at it very quickly. And look, if you will, at verse uh, number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and if you would please, verse number 5. When we respond to God's prompting, it's a reminder that our sufficiency is not in ourselves, but it is in God. God, you're, you're my sufficiency, and therefore whatever you want me to do with what I have, I rest in that, I rely upon you. Verse 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says this, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves. Notice, but our sufficiency is of God. Go over to chapter uh, 12, if you will, in verse number 9. Chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians and verse number 9. Again, this idea of God's sufficiency. Verse 9, and he, this is Paul as he interacts with Christ and his battle with the thorn in the flesh. He says, my grace is, notice, sufficient for thee, For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I just give you something practical today that until you've been there, you're probably not going to believe me and you're probably not going to be able to relate to this. But there is there's something about the moment where I take what I need, what I what what needs to be for my just my survival and my day to day. And I take that and I give that to someone else. Maybe it's the time in my day when I really need this time to get done, when I need it, when I take something that I I see as a need, and I give that to God and I am weak and I am desperate, and without God I can't get through the next 30 minutes kind of feeling, you're missing a whole new level of God's grace. I think we've got, and again, I'm for budgets, I'm for planning, I'm for stewardship. But many of us are very unfamiliar with that moment of giving out of our need to someone else and therefore receiving from God a special blessing of His grace. Paul in this moment said, "There, you go on, he says, I glory then in infirmity, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, that I might experience this grace in a supernatural way. And so the prompting of God sometimes leads to us to give what we need so that He can provide for us supernaturally what only He can bless and what He can provide. And again, that has so many applications. I trust you'll yield to that in the area of application God's given. Uh, Verse 9, let's go on to that if you will very quickly back in chapter number 9. Verse 9, he goes on to talk about, notice he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. This abounding grace that's mentioned in verse 8, refers to more than this, just the provisions of our needs in the moment. It reaps what? An eternal reward. Here's the idea of verse 9 if you missed it. It's worth it to give to God because the reward is not just temporal. Uh, trust me, if you do what God prompts you to do in your management of anything you have and anything that you are, you will be eternally validated for the investment you make. I don't need to validate it. You don't need to validate it. God will. And so as we give of ourselves, as we respond when God prompts, there is an eternal validation of what God has led us to do. And this practical giving, this practical sacrifice yields harvest. Galatians, go there very quick. I think we have time. You need to see this verse and the idea of planting. Galatians chapter number 6 and verse 7. And this carries with it the idea of the eternal reward of when God prompts we give. Galatians chapter 6, and if you would please, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Right? That's the most you can get in this life. Notice the end of the verse. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap, notice, life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And so it is life everlasting. It has eternal rewards and blessings. Then if you would, very quickly, go back to our text there. Notice in verse number 10, he goes on to say, Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. He quotes here from Psalm 112, verse 9, as well as Isaiah 55 and verse 10, to prove that God blesses the person who is faithful in giving. He supplies the seed. 
so that the sowers may make bread for food and also have more seed for sowing. He supplies our needs as we're faithful to give what God has given to us. And so there's a divine sufficiency. Here's my prayer for you, and it's my prayer for my own family and my own life. I'd, I'd like to stop taking care of my own needs and I'd like to start taking care of other people's needs. And the only way that is possible is when I begin to respond to God's prompting to where I'm meeting other people's needs, God is meeting my needs. We spend so much time collecting seed, eating seed, when God gave us that seed to plant it. And when we plant it faithfully, God promises He will be sufficient. He will enable us. He will sustain us through every season and struggle of life. May we this morning be open and excited about that possibility. Now, verse 11 ends with this thought. And to me, here's what is the climax of the study. Verse 11, he says, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. There's that word again, bountifulness, which causeth notice through us. This is what it's all about. Which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to God. I was reading the other day a story about a gentleman named Andor Folds. Uh, he was a skilled pianist years ago and He'd had a very difficult year, and he decided to have a concert, and at that concert was one of his mentors, a well-known uh, pianist, uh, whose name was Emil von Sauer. Uh, Emil von Sauer was famous not only for his abilities, but the fact that he was the last surviving pupil, uh, pupil of the great Franz Litz. Franz Litz was the pupil of Beethoven, and so this guy's here, two generations removed from Beethoven, and he's sitting, and he listens to this young man play the piano, going through a hard year and very gifted pianist. And this seasoned pianist walks up to this young man, 16 years of, old, of age, and he, he kisses him on the head and no words are said. And as he leaves, the student remembered that years before he had heard his mentor say that he himself had received the same affirmation from his teacher who had received the same affirmation from Beethoven himself. And so the kiss had been passed from Beethoven to his prodigy to the next generation, as if to say, now you have this blessing, you have this affirmation. Here's the application today. I want, listen to me, I want God's kiss upon my life. I, I want his unmistakable favor. And the only way that is possible is not when I, when I hold on to and when I hoard and when I try to manage life, but when I surrender to Him and He's able to bless, He's able to multiply, He's able to grow what He's entrusted to me. His kiss, His favor, His saturation. And here in verse 11 that we just read, lastly it engages God's declared saturation. Everyone knows that God has filled our life, enriched us in everything, and He gets glory for it. The more one gives to others, the more he is enriched, and thus he can be generous on every occasion. And now God gets glory on a regular basis through and in our lives. Can I ask you this morning, does your life, does your family, does your church overflow with blessings that are connected to where God has prompted you and where God has prompted me? One of the things that's exciting to me is some of you have been in our churches for a few years. Many of you are reaping blessings from people who early on gave much to see this church birthed. I can think of dozens of churches who regularly had people in pews that would write out a few dollars a week to give to missions that helped us launch this church. There were people that early on cleared the parking lot for us at other buildings we've been at, and they lugged stuff in and out of buildings. And some of them aren't even here anymore, but they invested in things. Now you're blessed, you're blessed and you're benefiting from that. I'm the product of my influences. So are you. We all today are reaping where others have sown. The question is, are we continuing that process in our lives and in our legacy and in the influence that we leave to those that follow us? A couple of weeks ago, my uncle uh, Jim was here. I guess it's been a couple months ago. You may have met him. He's from the Atlanta area. And uh, he retired from Delta. He was uh, the head mechanic there at, at Delta's uh, hub there in Atlanta, their main hub, worldwide headquarters. And he was visiting in our service, and if you remember, his wife, my Aunt Ann, passed away just a couple years ago. My brother and I had a part in the funeral, um, and he was with us uh, a few months ago. He said something to me at the end of the service that was moving that I'll share in just a moment, but just a little bit of backstory before I tell you what he said to me. Uh, my Uncle Jim and my Aunt Ann were very instrumental. They were in Atlanta. I was going to school in Pensacola. Atlanta's between here, where I grew up, over in the Mansfield area, and home, and so they would often 
they would meet me at the airport if I was flying through to come home. Um, my Aunt Anne would meet me with Chick-fil-A, uh, biscuit and chicken sandwiches, two or three of those for a college kid's appetite. And we'd sit, that was back when you could meet each other at the terminal, you know, and had more interaction. And they would sometimes get me a buddy pass home if I needed it for a funeral as my grandparents passed away. But they, I'm, my point is they just, they invested much in me when no one else knew who I was, not that too many do now, but when I was just a nobody and they saw God uh, working in my life, were in the support that as I went to Bible college. He was here, um, I guess, like I said, it's been a few months ago, and he just said to me afterwards, we went to dinner, he said, as he's reflecting back on the years we've shared together, and now my Aunt Anne is gone, he said, your Aunt Anne would be proud of you, or your Aunt Anne would be thankful for what God's done in your life. And what was neat about it was he sat there, I don't know, it probably was an average sermon at best, but he was blessed in a special way because years ago he invested in me. God used him. There's a blessing connected to investing that sometimes takes years to reap, but it's something you, you can't know, you can't share it unless you first shared in the sowing season. And for you today, I love you enough to encourage you, there is joy yet to come. There's enriching that's not just about you, but it's about others being able to thank God for how God has used you in their life. But if we will not respond when God prompts and when we should be planting, we're never going to get to the praise stage. We're never going to get to the glorious stage of celebrating what God has done. There's a really sad story in the news this past week uh, in Canton. I don't know if you saw it or not, but a baby, not in the moment, but several hours later, died from a wound, infant, from a dad taking a coffee cup in a moment of rage, throwing it at his wife, missing the wife and hitting the baby. And what was sad about the story was the guy's friend said, I can't believe this happened. He said, and this guy had just been drinking with this guy the night before, said he really loved that baby. No, he loved himself, didn't he? And but by the grace of God, any of us would be there. He loved himself more than that baby. And I think often we don't see the impact of what we love, what we give ourselves to, and how it hurts or how it helps those that follow after question I would give you this morning is this. Will you put God first in your prompted giving? Will you allow Him to prompt you so that you might be a blessing for others and you also might receive the blessings for yourself? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the joy it is to preach it.